My title today is Byron and the Difficulty of Beginning. Byron was a poet who had trouble beginning his poems. Not that he had trouble starting to write, or wrestled with writer's block, or stared for hours at a blank page. No, he wrote rapidly and fluently. He drafted The Bride of Abydos in four days, and The Corsair in ten, and he wrote three cantos of Don Juan in as many months in 1823. He wasn't the kind of writer who had long dry spells between moments of inspiration. He began new poems often and published regularly throughout his writing life, despite occasional claims to have given up authorship and statements that he did not consider poetry to be his vocation. So the problem was not beginning to write a poem. It was writing a poem's beginning. Byron often returned to the beginnings of his poems, revising them and adding to them and changing them. He employed a range of paratexts that complicated the beginnings of his longer poems, including subtitles, dedications, advertisements, prefaces, proems and epigraphs. And the frequency with which he revisited, added to or complicated the beginnings of his poems suggests the extent to which the poetic act of beginning was one that was fraught with difficulty for him. But over time, I want to suggest, Byron's difficulty with writing beginnings led him to make beginning a central concern of his poetry, both as a poetic necessity and as an existential condition. Now, the beginning of any work of writing is an especially conspicuous part of it, of course, and so writers often devote special attention to how a work begins. Beginnings are momentous, but they're also kind of arbitrary. Byron had translated in his Hints from Horace of 1811, Horace's observation that the Iliad began not ab ovo, from the egg, but in medias res, in the middle of things, opening with a quarrel between Achilles and Agamemnon that takes place nine years after the siege of Troy had begun. Returning to Horace's observation at the beginning of Don Juan, Byron noted how most epic poets plunge in medias res, and then your hero tells, whene'er you please, what went before by way of episode. Now this stanza is the sixth one in the published poem, but it was the second stanza in Byron's earliest manuscript. So Horace's comments on epic beginnings were uppermost in his mind as he began writing his own comic epic. Faced with questions about the right way to begin, and about how the beginning relates to what follows, Byron briskly rejected Horace's prescription. He says, that is the usual method, but not mine, and claimed that my way is to begin with the beginning. Now, this kind of breezy insouciance was, in fact, I want to suggest, the hard-won result of a sustained engagement with problems of poetic beginning. Beginning implies continuation, and it's therefore a declaration of intent to continue in a certain way. To be coherent, a beginning must contain some sense of the work that it begins, some sense of where things are going. Now, that's not to say that the beginning has to explain what will follow from it, or either at the level of plot or, or otherwise, but to recognise that any beginning has to suggest to the reader that what is coming will unfold in a way that connects it coherently to this particular beginning. In this respect, whether or not a beginning foreshadows what follows, it sets up expectations that will operate on the rest of the work. The writer might fulfil those expectations or frustrate them, but he or she cannot avoid creating them. It is in the nature of an artistic beginning to establish, at some level, the conventions and parameters within which the work will operate. Concerns about narrative, Genre, audience and authority therefore tend to cluster around the beginning of a work. <coughs> Excuse me. So, a fully elaborated account of 18th century and Romantic period beginnings is beyond the scope of what I can do today. But the complexities of lots of works in this period suggest that Byron's concern with beginning was widely shared by his immediate predecessors and his contemporaries. Think about Henry Fielding, who begins Tom Jones with a bill of fare that promised to set out what was to follow for his reader's delectation, acknowledging that what pleased some would not please all. 
Lawrence Stern made the difficulty of getting the story started into a running joke in Tristram Shandy. Samuel Taylor Coleridge repeatedly revised the prefatory paratexts of the ancient mariner, rethinking the poem's beginning through several versions. Mary Shelley, Walter Scott and many other novelists employed frame narratives to add layers of significance to the beginnings of their novels, and that of course became a convention of the Gothic novel. Wordsworth's prelude is, in a sense, an extended beginning, envisaged as a prefatory work for the, for the recluse. So Byron's concerns about beginning were not his alone. While concerns about artistic beginning are historically widespread, in a sense any writer, any artist at any moment in history has to think about how to begin, I want to think that the developing print culture of the late 18th and early 19th century may have helped to intensify these concerns. The upsurge in the total output of printed matter and the growth of an increasingly large readership for it created a widespread sense that the market for new books was overloaded. There was just too much stuff in print. And this put particular pressure on beginnings to hook and hold the reader's attention in an environment where he or she could easily put down one book and pick up another. I think the Romantic period is one of the first historical moments where you get generalised among a broad readership, that sense of information overload, of there being too much to pay attention to, which is very uh, familiar to us today. And so patronage relationships begin to give way to first subscription publication and then increasingly to fully commercial publication of a modern kind. And in this environment, the opening of a literary work increasingly had to secure a readership whose prior existence could not be assumed. When Byron was working on the fourth canto of Child Harold, he sent his publisher John Murray what he called the shaft of the column as a specimen, i.e. the first stanza. And this stanza offers a bold beginning. I stood in Venice on the bridge of Sighs, a palace and a prison on each hand. Murray showed the stanza to his advisers William Gifford, John Hookham Frere, and many more, according to Murray's correspondence. And he encouraged Byron to finish the work. So the beginning of the poem functioned for the publisher and his advisers as it would function for potential pur purchasers. It offered a sample of what was to follow, an indication of its nature and a guarantee of its quality. Having received Murray's encouragement, Byron began to negotiate the price that the publisher would pay for the poem. In fact, the fact that Byron sent the first stanza, detached from the rest of the poem, as a way of opening this negotiation, suggests the importance of poetic beginnings in this period, both artistically and commercially. Byron often went back over the beginnings of his longer poems and reworked them in an effort to manage the concerns, the anxieties that seem to cluster around beginnings. When revising the first canto of Child Harold's Pilgrimage from 1812, he added a new first stanza at a late stage of the process. It employed the classical, innovation, the classical invocation of the muse, O thou, in hellas deemed of heavenly birth, muse. But it maintained an ironic distance from the convention, describing the muse as formed or fabled at the minstrel's will. It also registered Byron's sense of historical belatedness, asserting that the muse had been shamed full oft by later liars, and describing the poem as a lowly lay unworthy of her attention. By adding this stanza on to the beginning of the poem, Byron signalled how his conception of the poem had changed during the process of writing. The first stanza from the earlier manuscript version, which becomes the second stanza in the published version, had employed a, a whole set of mock archaic words, such as whilom and white and wassailers, uh, to signpost its burlesque Spenserian diction uh, and introduce a comic strand into a poem designed gently to mock Byron and some of his friends. So this way of beginning no longer seemed adequate in light of uh, the revisions that Byron had made to the poem, especially after uh, a series of deaths of people close to him uh, in the immediate, um, uh, sort of immediately before the poem was published. So this stanza gets displaced from pole position by a new first stanza exhibiting a classicising vocabulary. And the two versions of the poem's beginning employed two linguistic registers, 
envisage two kinds of continuation with diverging expectations, conventions and audiences. Byron revisited the poem's beginning, creating a new moment of beginning without cancelling the original one, and thus embedded in its opening gestures mixed messages about the poem that was to follow. And we'll see that this is quite common for Byron to go back to the beginning of a poem, change it, add something else, but leave the original idea for the beginning intact, so that in effect the poem begins and then begins again. You can see something similar happening at the beginning of Don Juan, Canto I. Byron drafted an opening that moved straight from the first stanza's abrupt assertion, I want a hero, to the reference to epic convention of beginning in medias res in what's now the received sixth stanza, but was originally the second stanza in the manuscript. One of his final revisions to the first canto, six months after he started writing it, was to add a further four stanzas after the first stanza. Right? That's our received stanzas two to five. And these four stanzas list contemporary military figures that he claimed to have considered and rejected as heroes for his poem. So this deploys another epic convention, right? The catalogue of subjects that the poet has thought about uh, before alighting on the poem's theme. That's a convention of epic. But significantly, it's not a convention of epic beginnings. Milton waited until Book 9 of Paradise Lost to catalogue rejected subjects and heroes, while Wordsworth wrote 180 lines of Book 1 of the Prelude before producing a similar catalogue. By putting his own version of this epic catalogue of rejected heroes at the very beginning of his poem, Byron signals both that it will rely on his readers' knowledge of epic conventions and that it will employ those conventions ironically or in a kind of skewed way. Byron's revisions to the opening of Child Howard's Pilgrimage and Don Juan show how he went back to the beginnings of his poems, rethought them, polished them up, how his intentions regarding beginnings wavered, were unstable. Concerns about how to begin were just multiplied by multi-part works, such as poems in several cantos or poems published in several instalments. And these works required Byron not only to begin, but also to re-begin in later sections or instalments. And such moments of re-beginning had a doubly difficult task. They had to look back to what came before while launching a new part of the work. They had to acknowledge continuities going backwards in time while also indicating new departures, reassuring the audience that something different was coming that wasn't just a repeat of what they'd already read. Returning to Child Harold in 1816, four years after the previous instalment of the poem had been published, Byron had to negotiate both the relationship of this new canto to the first two and the concern that he had lost the readership his earlier cantos had reached. He began by hailing his daughter as the poem's addressee, departing from the imagined addressees of the first cantos. But he fractured the first stanza and began again in the second stanza, once more upon the waters, yet once more. This echoes both Milton's Lycidas, yet once more, O ye laurels, and once more, ye myrtles brown, and Shakespeare's Henry V, once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more. The canto begins then with overtones of both mourning, Lycidas, and resuming battle, Henry V as Byron returns to the literary marketplace while facing the emotional turmoil of his separation from his wife <coughs> and infant daughter. When writing and revising the beginnings of his longer poems, Byron often tried to displace responsibility for beginning in some way. Sometimes he began poems with a close imitation of someone else's poetry, as though he could prop his own poetic beginning on another poet's artistry. The echoes of Milton and Shakespeare that I just mentioned at the beginning of Child Harold Canto III are one example of this, but there are other examples and I think more pronounced ones. English Bards and Scotch Reviewers from 1809 begins with a couplet closely modelled on lines from Juvenal's satire No. 1, which Byron quoted. He acknowledged the source in a footnote. So this choice signals the poem's claim to an authority based in classical education. It also functions as a genre marker alerting readers that this is a Juvenalian satire rather than, say, a Horatian or a Menippean one. It thus makes clear from the outset that this poem is aimed at an audience able to appreciate the classical 
uh, imitation and relish slashing invective, such as might, one might expect to find in a juvenalian satire. Translating Latin poetry as an opening gesture is an act of filiation that asserts authority while also displacing that authority onto a classical precursor. It positions Byron as a latter-day juvenile, uh, a little bit like he would later use the a pseudonym Quevedo Redividus, positioning himself as a, a, a reborn Quevedo. But it also provides a way of beginning that draws on existing lines of poetry rather than requiring new ones. The secondary imitative creativity of translation smoothed the path to writing original poetry. Byron used this technique again in The Bride of Abydos from 1813, which begins with a free translation of lines from Mignon's song Kennst du das Land, in Goethe's Wilhelm Meister. Here Byron pays a concealed tribute to an admired older contemporary. Beginning in this way uses Goethe's poetry as a sort of warm-up for Byron's own, inserting, without acknowledgement, some lines of translation before the reader encounters original poetry. So this again displaces the need to begin, allowing a translation to provide a stepping stone to get the poem started, a sort of springboard towards Byron's own poetry. This tactic effectively splits the difficult task of beginning in two. First Byron starts writing, and then he starts writing original poetry. In both English Bards and The Bride of Abydos, another writer's words in a different language provide support for the poem's opening lines. At the beginning of other poems, or poem sections, Byron turned not to another poet's lines, but to lines that he'd already written himself in another context. To begin the third canto of the Corsair, 1814, he lifted a passage of 54 lines from The Curse of Minerva, a poem that he had privately printed, but which by this time he'd given up any plans of publishing. The lines are a description of a sunset over Athens, which makes the speaker recall the death of Socrates. In The Curse of Minerva, these lines begin the poem and introduce the speaker's vision of Minerva, who appears to him to pronounce her curse on Lord Elgin for removing the Parthenon marbles. Faced with the difficulty of beginning the Corsair Canto III, Byron recruited a poetic beginning that he had already made elsewhere, displacing the task of beginning onto his own earlier self. <coughs> Doing so produced a palpable sense of embarrassment. The first new lines of poetry that he wrote for the canto acknowledged the difficulty of integrating the borrowed beginning with the rest. Not now my theme, why turn my thoughts to thee, Byron writes. And he added an end note to the first edition, admitting that Quote, the opening lines, as far as section two, have perhaps little business here and were annexed to an unpublished, though printed, poem. But they were written on the spot in the spring of 1811, and I scarce know why the reader must excuse their appearance here if he can. So the first original lines that Byron wrote for the third canto of the Corsair are thus not a beginning, but a transitional passage of 11 lines that serves to link the borrowed beginning to the resumption of the poem's narrative in the third numbered section. Right? So you have section one, borrowed beginning that Byron's already written for another poem. Section two, transition passage. Section three, the narrative gets started again. And conscripting his earlier poetry eased the difficulty of beginning the canto, but this decision left its mark on the poem in an awkward transition and an apologetic end note. Byron had earlier considered using a similar strategy in prose when he planned to reuse phrases from the beginning of his maiden speech in the House of Lords to open his second speech. Standing to speak in the House for the first time at the debate on the Frame Bill in February 1812, Byron started his speech by introducing himself as a stranger not only to this House in general, but to almost every individual whose attention I presume to solicit. Two months later, when drafting his speech for the Roman Catholic claims debate, Byron began his draft by repeating that sentence almost verbatim. Apparently, he still felt like a stranger in the House of Lords. <laughs> 
But he did reconsider that. He crossed out the sentence uh, along with the first four lines with which he began his draft and did not use that form of words in the final version of the speech. So although those words weren't spoken in his second speech, this draft provides another example of Byron revisiting, uh, trying to start a, a piece of writing by borrowing from the beginning of a piece of writing that he's already written and then going back and reconsidering the beginning of this new piece of writing. The fact that introductory lines could sometimes be extracted from one poem and inserted in another suggests how tenuous their connection was to the poems they began. Rather than plunging directly into the action of the narrative or introducing its characters, these opening passages usually tend to dwell on scene setting. The narrative then begins at a slightly later point, often in a separate numbered section. By adopting this approach, Byron sort of doubled the moment of beginning not only as a result of the revisions that I've been describing, but also by separating generalised scene setting descriptions from the beginning of the plot. The Jawa, the Bride of Abydos, the Corsair and Parisina all begin in this way. Lara from 1814 unusually doesn't begin like this. It just goes straight into the narrative with very little scene setting preamble. But Byron also wrote an alternative scene setting beginning for Lara a 25-line fragment which he titled Opening Lines to Lara in his manuscript. He doesn't seem to have sent it to the publisher and it was not published until the 20th century. Lara, unique among the tales then, did not seem to need a detachable opening passage of scene setting, even though Byron did write one. He sort of he had one you know, up his sleeve in case it was needed, but he didn't feel that Lara needed it. But in another sense, Lara had the longest such passage of all Byron's verse tales, so long that it became a tale in its own right. Lara was identified in its advertisement as a sequel to the Corsair. Its beginning is therefore a kind of re-beginning that leans on the scene setting from the earlier tale. Byron's technique in all of these examples splits the beginning of the poem from the beginning of the story. So that's another form of the displacing that I've been talking about that allows Byron to relieve the pressure on the moment of beginning by spreading the work of beginning across several moments of writing. As well as displacing responsibility for beginning onto other poets whose words he could translate or onto his earlier self whose words he could repurpose, Byron also tried to displace the responsibility onto other people. While the siege of Corinth was in the press, Byron had second thoughts about the beginning, as by now you can see was very common for him, and he sent an alternative opening section of 45 lines to be fitted onto the front of the poem. Again, this is very common. See, he, he writes this new section and he says, put that on the front, but don't change what's there. Just add a new section to the front, leaving the original beginning intact. So he told Murray, his publisher, that this had been written some time ago and intended as an opening to the siege of Corinth. Like his late revisions to the beginning of Child Howard's Pilgrimage, the new lines were designed not to replace the existing beginning, but to appear before it, doubling the moment of beginning, or turning the lines that were initially conceived as the poet's be poem's beginning into a continuation of the new lines that would now appear before them. But if Byron was unsure about how good his first attempt to begin siege was, he was no more confident about his second effort. I am not sure that they had not better be left out, he wrote, and he left it to you and your synod to choose. And Murray and his advisers, his synod as Byron called them, felt that the poem was really better off without the new lines and Byron deferred to their judgment. And the lines were not published until the 20th century. In this example, Byron allowed someone else to make the crucial decision about how to begin the poem on his behalf. Something similar happened at the beginning of the Corsair where Byron again vacillated and deferred to someone else's judgment. In this case, it was the dedicatory letter to Thomas More that caused him to think twice rather than the beginning of the poem itself. Byron wrote a long dedication to More, his friend and fellow poet, praising More and alluding to his views on Irish politics, as well as discussing Byron's own poetry to date and declaring his intention to take a hiatus from publishing for some years, a resolution he did not keep. Now, Murray cautioned Byron about the political tone of the letter and Byron wrote another version that was much shorter and much less political. But rather than just substitute this for the first version, Byron sent both letters to Thomas More, their addressee, and asked him to choose between them. And More said he preferred the first version, the longer one, 
Uh, and Byron insisted then that this was the version that should be published. When writing the beginnings of both Siege of Corinth and the Corsair then, Byron deferred to other people's opinions about how best to handle the opening gestures of his works, like his use of translations or repurposed lines of poetry at the beginnings of other poems. This practice served to shift responsibility for beginning away from the poet, so he helped to mitigate the anxieties that beginnings apparently aroused. Now this dedicatory letter to the Corsair was only one of many paratexts that uh, appeared at the beginnings of Byron's longer poems. And he very often multiplied paratexts so that readers approach his long poems through thickets of prefatory material. In Child Howard's Pilgrimage, for example, the title is followed by a subtitle, a romount, an epigraph, a prose preface, an addition to the preface, added in the fourth edition, the prefatory poem To Ianthe, added in the seventh edition, and the heading Canto I, before you get to the opening stanza. Don Juan similarly opens with this kind of proliferation of prefatory gestures. The title is followed by an epigraph, a prose preface parodying Wordsworth's Note to the Thorn, which was not published until 1901, a verse dedication to Robert Southey, not published until 1833, and the heading Canto I before the first stanza. Now, Byron probably never intended the, uh, certainly Don Juan, to appear with all of these paratexts stacked up in top of each other before the poem starts. Um, but in both cases, Byron repeatedly goes back to the opening pages of these books, reimagining what they will look like several times. He added new material to the beginning of Child Harold in the fourth and seventh editions. He rejected his first idea for Don Juan's epigraph, Domestica Facta, as a result of the misgivings expressed by his friend John Cam Hobhouse, and considered having no epigraph at all before settling on what became the published epigraph, uh, Difficile est proprie communie dicere. It is hard to speak of common things. He wrote the dedication to Southey and then set it aside and wrote the prose preface, which he also set aside. So at the beginning of Byron's two greatest poems, he rethought and revisited the opening paratexts, adding new dimensions to the work's opening, rejecting existing paratexts and writing new ones. And this has the effect of displacing the moment of beginning and multiplying what Gerard Genet uh, has named the thresholds of interpretation. When does the reader really begin reading Child Harold or Don Juan? At the title page? The epigraph? The preface? The introductory poetry? Or not until the reader has worked through all of these, or perhaps skipped over them, and got to the opening lines of the first canto? Proliferating paratexts complicates the beginnings of these poems, but it also reduces the pressure on any one moment of writing to launch the poem successfully. So this tendency is very characteristic of Byron, I think, to want to defocalise the moment of beginning by surrounding it with other moments of beginning. All the verse tales and longer poems that he wrote between Child Harold and Don Juan begin with some permutation of paratexts, including title, subtitle, epigraph, dedication, prose advertisement, preface or note. And the most extensive combinations of paratexts occur in the earlier tales, suggesting just how difficult Byron found the poetic act of beginning. The Jower from 1813 begins with a title, subtitle, epigraph, dedication and advertisement before the opening lines of poetry. The Corsair starts with a title, subtitle, epigraph, dedication and an epigraph to the first canto before the first lines of poetry. And all the other tales are the same. They all draw on the same kind of set of prefatory materials. Byron might have been sensitised to the importance of getting this prefatory matter right because his earliest attempts to deploy it had gone so disastrously wrong. Henry Brougham's review of Hours of Idleness from 1807 had spent almost the whole length of the review attacking the title page formulation by George Gordon, Lord Byron, a minor. And the prose preface in which Byron had stressed his nobility and his youth in an effort to deflect the, the critics' bad reviews. But the fact that Byron went on to carry on to use prefatory materials so extensively, despite the bad reviews that they'd received early on, suggests how much he relied on them as tools to facilitate poetic beginnings. While prefatory materials facilitated the task of beginning for the poet, they also kind of complicated it for the reader. 
The advertisements that Byron prefixed to his tales often identified the source material that he'd drawn on in writing the poem. In doing so, they raised questions about the relationship between the beginning of the narrative in this poem and its origin in another piece of writing. In every case, Byron uses prefatory material to point back before the beginning of the poem that the reader is about to begin, locating its origins in some other written text, including quite often texts in other languages. The imminent poetic beginning is set against an antecedent prose origin. And this provides another way to displace the moment of beginning or to proliferate beginnings in order to manage the apprehensiveness that beginning engenders. These advertisements provided readers with further reading, but they also provided them with prior reading. They directed those readers who enjoyed the poem to other texts that would tell them more about the events or people or uh, settings that inspired it. But they also seemed to hint that the poem could only fully be appreciated by those who already had some knowledge of these things. And they therefore reflected what I think is a common anxiety associated with the beginning of a literary work. The difficulty of deciding what kind of knowledge to take for granted in the audience. What you can expect people to know. Stanley Fish shows how Milton expertly dispatches this difficulty in the first line of Lycidas. Yet once more, O ye laurels. Addressing the laurel trees, Fish points out, signals clearly that this is a pastoral elegy, and so it calls at the outset for an audience already familiar with the conventions of that genre. Readers gain that kind of familiarity from other examples of the pastoral elegy, and so for write, to write for this kind of informed reader is always to begin yet once more. To begin a poem is always and necessarily to begin again to speak up amidst a crowd of other poems that are speaking already, and to offer the reader a new version of something that he or she has heard before. To begin entails holding some conception of who will be engaged by this beginning, and what kind of knowledge or competence the reader can be expected to have. In the Romantic period, however, doing this, formulating a conception of the audience implied by a poetic beginning, arguably became more difficult. The rapidly enlarging readership of the period and the perception that a mass audience was emerging, even if this perception did sometimes run ahead of the facts, produced a specific set of worries about what readers could be expected to know. Providing prefatory matter that outlined what readers needed to know before the start of the poem provided one way to address this concern. But several of Byron's poems also take it up obliquely in their opening lines. The Bride of Abydos, for example, which we've already mentioned, begins by asking readers what they know. Know ye the land where the cypress and myrtle are emblems of deeds that are done in their clime. Like the opening lines of Lycidas, these lines use trees to signal generic affiliation. They identify the poem as a Turkish tale, that's its subtitle, a genre that Byron's works were still helping to shape in this period, and they prompt the reader to expect the deeds of passion and violence that were fast becoming hallmarks of the genre. But casting the opening as a question, for following the model in Goethe's lyric, Kenst du das Land, also reveals a submerged concern about what exactly the reader can be relied upon to know. Now, very few of Byron's readers actually shared his first-hand knowledge of the tale setting. Right? The answer to the question, do you know the land, is almost always going to be no. Um, so he couldn't necessarily assume that they were familiar with the setting or with the nascent generic conventions that his beginning evoked. The beginning of the poem can therefore be read as a way of asking what kind of readerly knowledge the poem can take for granted. Byron returned to this problem several times in different ways. Where the Bride of Abydos starts by asking readers what they know, Don Juan Canto VI begins by telling them what they know. There is a tide in the affairs of men which, taken at the flood, you know the rest. And Beppo begins by telling readers what they should know about the Venetian carnival. Tis known, at least it should be, before going on to tell them about it anyway. In all these cases, then, the beginning of the poem betrays Byron's concern with what his readers can be expected to know. However, by the time he got to Beppo, beginning had taken on a different kind of importance for Byron. 
it was no longer just a challenge to overcome, something that you had to do to get the poem started. It was now a key resource sustaining the poem's comic aplomb. In Beppo, opening gestures are not confined to the beginning of the poem, but recur throughout. As in the tales I've already talked about, Byron separates the beginning of the poem from the beginning of its narrative. But whereas in the earlier poems this is a way to ease into the beginning of the narrative, in Beppo it becomes part of a running joke about the narrator's inability to get the story started. 21 stanzas out of the poem's 99 have passed before the speaker says, but to my story. And this beginning gesture is one that has to be renewed repeatedly as the hopelessly digressive narrator seeks to get his narrative back on track. But to my tale of Laura, he says, at the poem's exact midpoint in stanza 50. And again, close to two thirds of the way through, to turn and to return, the devil take it, this story slips forever through my fingers. In common with many of Byron's earlier poems then, Beppo has some difficulty beginning. But with the turn to comic Ottava Rima, this difficulty has ceased to be a liability and has instead become a poetic resource, borrowed in part from the comic digressions of Laurence Stern's Tristram Shandy, another work comically concerned with the difficulty of beginning, which Byron acknowledged as a model for Don Juan. Like Beppo, Don Juan proliferates beginning gestures throughout the poem, but on a much larger scale. Its 16 completed cantos offer 16 distinct occasions on which to begin or rebegin the poem. And the fact that Byron intends to approach these beginnings playfully with self-reflexive and self-deprecating irony is apparent from the opening of Canto 3. And this is the first time that the poem resumes in a new publication because Cantos 1 and 2 were published together. And so the, the canto opens like this. Hail muse, etc. We left you and sleeping. So this reprises the ironic invocation of the muse at the beginning of Child Howard's pilgrimage while dispensing with the anxieties the earlier poem had betrayed. Nicholas Halmy calls it the most perfunctory invocation in the history of the epic. We're now in a self-consciously belated comic epic which hails not so much a muse as an audience for whom invocations of the muse have become an outworn convention. Don Juan signals in its first gesture of re-beginning that it seeks an audience as knowing as its narrator. It is a measure of how far Byron has overcome his concerns about his reader's knowledge, that by the beginning of Canto 14 he can write, you know or don't know that great bacon saith, fling up a straw, twill show the way the wind blows. Here the reader's knowledge has become a matter of indifference, not anxiety. Such moments of re-beginning will be repeated throughout the poem and not, at the beginning of new, not only at the beginning of new cantos either, but elsewhere as well. It should come as no surprise to read one of them midway through Canto 12. The classical epics have 12 books, the Aeneid, or 24 in the case of the Homeric epics, and so the 12th canto is the place where one might expect to find either things starting to draw to a close or perhaps a midpoint, a pivot. On the contrary... Canto 12, stanza 54. But now I will begin my poem. It is perhaps a little strange, if not quite new, that from the first cantos up to this, I've not begun what we have to go through. These first 12 books are merely flourishes, preludios, trying a string or two upon my lyre, or making the pegs sure, and when so, you shall have the overture. As this makes clear, Don Juan is, in a sense, all beginning. Its beginning gestures are not confined to the beginning of the poem or even to the beginning of each canto, but recur throughout as comic ways of sustaining the poem's energies. Beginning has now become less of a technical problem and more of an existential condition. If Don Juan is a poem that cannot stop beginning, that is impelled to keep beginning again, this is because it represents a world in which the condition of beginning is pervasive and inescapable. All human endeavours in Don Juan are provisional and likely to be diverted from their intended courses by the force of circumstance. And this can be seen in the many characters whose plans go awry in the pro poem. Julia, Hady, Rauka Canty, John Johnson and many others, not least uh, Juan himself. Although does Juan even make any plans? I'll come to that in a minute. It's true of the narrator uh, whose plans are laid out at the end of Canto 1 and include 12 books and a panoramic view of hell, which never comes to pass. 
In the world of Don Juan, then, beginning any project in the expectation of bringing it to a conclusion is unlikely to meet with success. Instead, the poem's characters and its narrator are compelled continually to re-begin and to accept that their plans must remain provisional. In Canto 12, the narrator cheerfully acknowledges the plan at present simply in concoction. To begin in this poem is therefore a kind of hopeful gesture, a hopeful gesture but one carried out in the knowledge that all efforts to begin are likely to be truncated or to go astray. This doesn't mean though that there's an impasse where nothing is attempted because nothing goes to plan. Rather, Don Juan cultivates an optimistic approach to beginnings in which the need to revise one's projects and begin again can be met with equanimity. And this understanding comes into focus at the beginning of Canto 15, which provides another playfully self-reflexive opening. Here it is, first stanza of Canto 15. Ah, what should follow slips from my reflection? Whatever follows nevertheless may be as apropos of hope or retrospection as though the lurking thought had followed free. All present life is but an interjection, an O oh or R ah of joy or misery, or a ha-ha or ba, a yawn or poo, of which perhaps the latter is most true. While getting the canto off to a comic start, this stanza accepts the constructed nature of all artistic beginnings. Any decision to begin at a particular point in a particular way will be arbitrary at some level, and so an alternative beginning may be just as apropos. To begin purposefully entails some intention to continue in a particular way, but this stanza lists involuntary starts that skirt the edge of intentional speech. A yawn is not intentional, for example. The laugh, the explanations of joy or misery, and the sceptical interjections ba or poo may be intended or they may be involuntary. The not quite words offered here as poetic beginnings thus call into question the kind of intention a beginning requires. And the repeated use of follow, follow, follows, followed, underlines the ways in which beginnings structure expectations for what follows, but it also suggests that those expectations can be frustrated. This stanza then links the poetic problem to an existential condition. All present life is but an interjection. In our present life, our efforts to begin are necessarily provisional, they may not be fully under our control, and the plans that they inaugurate, whether those are artistic plans or other kinds of plans, are necessarily subject to change, like the beginning of this canto, which does not go according to even the minimal plan its speaker seems to have made for it. Rather than being discouraged by this fact, however, the narrator insists that an alternative beginning will be just as good. Those who fail to recognise this, who fail to acknowledge the provisional nature of beginnings, who arrogantly expect to carry through the plans that they have begun, are guilty of a sin of pride. As early as hints from Horace, Byron advised, beware, for God's sake, don't begin like Bowles. Now, William Bowles's fault was to have begun his poem, The Spirit of Discovery, with an epic opening that promised more than he could deliver. Borrowing from Virgil, as Wordsworth would later, Bowles began, awake a louder and a loftier strain. But Byron insisted that Bowles could not sustain his epic pretensions. Byron returned to this problem, this vanity of an overconfident beginning, at the start of Don Juan Canto IV, which begins, nothing so difficult as a beginning in poesy, unless perhaps the end. For oftentimes when Pegasus seems winning the race, he sprains a wing and down we tend like Lucifer, when hurled from heaven for sinning, our sin the same and hard as his to mend, being pride, which leads the mind to soar too far till our own weakness shows us what we are. One reason that beginnings are difficult is because they always risk hubris. To begin any project is to assert a kind of agency in the world that you might not actually have. To begin is to lay claim to the ability to continue, and failing to continue in the way the beginning envisages reveals the tightly circumscribed nature of human agency, as well as the vanity of trying to overreach it. A key insight of Don Juan, then, is that the difficulty of creating a poetic beginning is only a specific case of a more general condition of provisionality. Don Juan himself 
is well fitted for such a condition. For the most part, he's content to be carried along on the stream of contingencies without initiating any beginning of his own. Although he's not entirely passive and can respond to circumstances decisively, for example, when he shoots Tom the Highwayman on Shooter's Hill in Canto 11, he never makes plans and begins executing them. Carried from one situation to another, Don Juan, the character, is always and never beginning. Always beginning over again in response to changing situations, but never managing to instantiate any sustained program of action. In this respect, he reflects the poem that bears his name, which is also always beginning, always remaining open to contingency, always ready to adapt to circumstances. To conclude then, for much of his writing life, beginnings posed a problem for Byron, generating a whole cluster of anxieties. He frequently returned to the beginnings of his poems before publication, adding to them, revising them, worrying about their effectiveness. He developed several tactics to make this problem easier to deal with, which all sought in different ways to relieve the pressure of expectation on the opening lines of the poem. He displaced responsibility for beginning onto another poet whose words he could translate. He repurposed lines that he'd already written to serve as the beginnings of new poems. He deferred to the judgment of trusted advisors when making decisions about which version of a beginning would appear in print. He multiplied paratexts and prefatory gestures, proliferating moments of beginning and so making any one of those moments less conspicuous. He started poems with passages of scene-setting description, separating the opening of the poem from the beginning of its narrative. His beginnings revealed an anxiety about who would read his poems and whether they shared his knowledge and range of reference. But if the difficulty of beginning was initially a practical problem that Byron shared with other writers, over time it became a more individual concern, a self-reflexive subject of his poetry and a sustaining resource for it. Beppo and Don Juan do not only discuss the difficulty of beginning explicitly, they are kept going by the constant need to begin again and the impossibility of beginning so successfully that beginning can be left behind. Multiplying and revisiting moments of beginning began as a compensatory tactic developed to handle the cluster of anxieties associated with finalising the opening of a work but it became an artistic strategy sustaining the energy of Byron's longest poem. Where Byron had earlier revised moments of beginning, going back to the same opening line several times, in Don Juan, instead of revising, he restaged opening gestures throughout the poem in order to provide ways to start afresh while leaving earlier episodes behind. And Byron made this shift as he developed an existential vision of the world characterised by contingency, in which all projects were necessarily provisional. Beginning, in this view, was no longer an artistic problem to be solved. It was now a fundamental, endlessly repeated necessity in art as in life. Beginning had become an end in itself. Thank you. <laughs>